about these days is working on um, a project um, that is a second one to one that happened in 2012 and 2013. And so I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about that project, a very little bit. And then on the slides, I have a number of quotes from um, the first experience that we had with a sharing circle and an art show in 2012 and 13. And, uh, and so I'm hoping that because this is kind of like a discussion group that other people's words, even more than mine maybe, mm -hmm. um, will encourage and foster our discussion. So just wanting to open up by telling you a little bit of sort of foundational stuff about what it was that, that we did. And um, yeah, so um, as Adrian said, going to seminary a number of years ago, not that many, but um, starting seminary about eight years ago, um, I, uh, I think I had always been interested in change and how change happens. I mean, I was studying therapy, <laughs> so I'm interested in how people change and what encourages that. Um, but really began to wonder, like, what are some of the, the models that we use? And I'm a counselor, and so talk therapy is a big model that I've learned quite a bit about. And... Um, and, and just I'm also aware that that's a good model and it can be used in really helpful ways, can also be used in not so helpful ways, um, but that there has to be ways that engage more than um, dialogue or engage dialogue creatively when it comes to how we as humans change and how the communities and cultures and societies that we're part of change. So... Um, so I just became curious about that. And so um, for anybody who's ever done a program like that, when you, when you go to school for a while, they'll usually, the people who make the rules about you know, programs and parameters and all that kind of stuff will say at the end, you have to prove yourself. You have to show what you've learned. And so you have to do some kind of project to demonstrate that you've gotten something from all the money you've given us. Um, so I chose to do a project that kind of brought these ideas together of how... Um, dialogue and something about our creative engagement with that dialogue can bring about change not only in us but in the larger community. So that's how this project that I'm going to share with you sort of came about. And so what we did was um, uh, a sharing circle and so that was bringing in dialogue but bringing it in, in in creative and maybe traditional and hopefully healing kinds of ways. And so I did a little bit of studying on what exactly a sharing circle, maybe traditionally or maybe historically, has been and how that could inform a way for, and I chose to do it with women only, um, a way for, for women, but in other contexts it's done with men too. Um, and... and um, both, both genders can be together in a sharing circle too, but in our circle we did it with women only. All women of all different backgrounds, um, all different histories, all different um, experiences. Some had children, um, some were from North America, some were not. And so just bringing, bringing together diverse women for dialogue and, and learning from one another. And um, not all sharing circles do this, but we chose to have a topic guiding our circle. So we got together for a number of weeks and we chose to have this topic of decolonization guiding our conversations together. And um, we, I just want to say that we weren't trying to prove something, we weren't trying to study something necessarily, we weren't trying to dissect something, we weren't trying to even necessarily, although this one we kind of were trying to do, fix something. We certainly weren't trying to fix each other. Um, we, we were just kind of like coming together to explore collaboratively and participate together in something around something we hoped that would develop among us. And um, so that's what we were doing. Um, and the thing about you know, deciding as a participant to participate in something like a sharing circle um, and having some collaborative dialogue with other people. And then our, our circle moved into um, making art that we presented to the community in an art show. Um, so the thing about doing that is that um, you make a decision individually and then you join together with other people to do something that is kind of collective and informed by other people. And then when you go into the art making phase, something sort of interesting begins to happen with whatever's been happening within you, whatever's been happening in the little community that you're part of. And so it's this like ever-growing um, uh, dynamic of 
perspective shift, possible perspective shift. And so it starts kind of in here with the decision, I'm going to do this, I want to participate in this. And then as you do it and you participate with other people, you're shaped by them, they are shaped by you, and the story of what you are together begins to grow and have a dynamic. Um, and then you kind of begin to put that either into color or some kind of maybe verbal or poetic expression or tell stories about it or share it with your neighbors. And it's got this like expanding reach, hey, that started with you. That started with your like, hey, maybe I want to do this, you know. And, um, and so that was something really neat about change and the way it happens. And um, that we sort of like um, wanted to, we wanted to do something that could, could incorporate this reach idea, this idea of this growing, expanding um, ability to impact the community, the larger community. And so really the art making that we did was, was, was able to do that. Um, yeah, so I said that we sort of set out not to explore, um, to explore something from our own experience and from our own hearts. So not necessarily to say, this is what the textbooks say, or this is what the academics say, or this is what some they out there has decided is valid for us to talk about, but we're actually going to decide from among us, apart from the topic of decolonization that we, that we gave ourselves, we're going to decide from among us how to talk about this, and how to maybe deconstruct this, and what experiences we want to share. And so we didn't really put any parameters on how that got done each week. Sometimes, um, sometimes we would ask somebody to bring something of meaning to them, a poem. Um, our art facilitator often would put something in the middle um, with some visual representations, often um, something from the land, you know, uh, often seeds, often medicines. Um, and these things would inspire us, but there wasn't a detailed, this is how we're going to be guided in our discussion today. So, so it was just kind of like there was some parameters, there was some structure, but it was also really unstructured and really open to whatever whatever the spirit among us and the spirit of the creator among us would sort of bring into life in our midst. Throughout the sharing circle, um, we gave each other permission to share what was helpful among us. Often in sharing circles, we sort of have this um, protocol that says what is said in the circle stays in the circle. But because we wanted to use our circle for the encouragement of, of ourselves in the community, we gave ourselves permission, and everybody did this, to share um, helpful things, encouraging things outside of the circle. And so that's why it's okay for me to share all this with you. Um, so this is one, so, so we did some interviews initially. Um, we, did some, we did some talking throughout about what it was that we were learning, and then we did some interviews at the end, and that's where all these um, quotes come from. Even if we weren't talking directly about decolonization, we were always doing decolonization. Decolonization defined our circle in lots of ways. So that's something that one of the participants said. Um, and I think they were referring to the fact that we were being fairly deliberate about not adhering to structures or expectations that might have been put on us. So this is some of the reasons people said why they wanted to participate. I want to let go of stereotypes. Um, I wish to understand better how I'm received as a white person. I want to change. I'm Canadian. This is my responsibility. Um, and so you guys are remembering that our participants were from all kinds of backgrounds. Um, about half were from indigenous communities, and um, half were from various other communities. We had some indigenous folks from, from not from Turtle Island as well. Um, so that was a really interesting thing too. So I'm not going to read them all, because I know we want to get on to other kinds of discussion um, with, with the group as well. But I'll read some of the ones that kind of jump out. If I believe apathy is as destructive as intentional harm, what else can I do but participate? Um, I think Canada needs to be different, so that means I need to be different. I don't want my fear to be in charge of me. I'm interested in this, and I want to see what happens if I do it instead of being scared of it. Um... So those were some of the reasons people said that they participated. And then on being uncomfortable talking about and experiencing um, the process of dialogue about de decolonization, some, one, of, one of the participants said, hey, if we aren't uncomfortable, we're not engaging in the right conversations. Decolonization requires discomfort. And so let's all just be aware of that and be ready for that. Um, 
and then some of the folks who were, were from non-Indigenous backgrounds. Um, can we talk about what it does to the human soul to actually think about what it is to be part of the dominant group? We've made ourselves superior. We've written ourselves a passport to dominate. And therefore, we've done serious harm to ourselves, and our humanity has been reduced. Um, this is, I have a few images of the art that we made together. Um, so this is one of our participants. Her name is Francine, and um, I, I just want to tell you about Francine. Maybe some of you might have run into her. Um, Francine now has this lovely little floral bag with wheels on it, and she puts her art in there, and she's done presentations at a few different places where she brings her art and um, shows it to school groups or other community groups, and uh, she's just gotten really into that. And so this was her image of decolonization. And so it starts out with the one person and then sort of like this that, that idea of the growing representation right something that starts with me can can grow outwards and into the community and what she says about that top image is um, it's all of us all the races all the people recognizing that we're all together under the same Sun <laughs> um, this was somebody reflecting on creativity and art as a way of expressing ourselves um, they just commented on how they were really appreciative of how we engage different aspects of ourselves than what we can engage if we're just thinking from our minds and using our mouth. So when we bring other kinds of experience and other kinds of creative expression, other kinds of reflections to the table and into the conversation, it, what, what is generated is different. So what, they, what this participant said was, we didn't only negotiate um, verbal and intellectual aspects of ourselves, the rest of our humanity got to matter too. Um, this one's hard to read, and, and I know there's a rule about PowerPoints that you're not supposed to squeeze a bunch of text onto a slide, so I broke that rule. Maybe you're getting the idea that I like to break rules a little bit. <laughs> um, but w this, is, this is a participant who said, I experienced a breakthrough. Um, when I heard this, I was crying. At the beginning and in the early stages of our circle, I felt hopeless. Like there was hopelessness about, there was only hopelessness about how things are. I desperately wanted to hope, but I didn't think our circle could really do anything. So I experienced a turnaround sometime around the beginning of art making. My change of heart surprised me, but it happened because I realized that despair is challenged through action. Isn't that profound? The realization of the history of oppression, the stubbornness in Canada, that hasn't changed, but I changed. I knew that I was part of something solid and real, and that changed my heart. And then she just said at the end, doing something makes a difference, you know? <laughs> How profound. <laughs> um, this is on some of the things that people talked about happening after. One of the participants said some people in her family asked her to host a discussion night so that they could all talk about decolonization. Um, her family had learned from the show. And if I remember right, this participant's family was not all that excited that she was doing this and having these conversations. And, um, and then they came to the art show and listened to some of the um, stories that were shared and how the experience had settled in, in some of the participants and then said, okay, talk to us about this. You can, you can come and have supper and we'll come to your house and, and talk about this. This is another one of our participants. That's actually Maria. She's the art. So we're doing this again, just so you guys know. This happened two years ago, but we're about to start a new one in March, and we'll have another art show in June. And so this is our art facilitator, Maria. And so this is the art piece she made for the last show. And it sort of is like these city images, urban images that reflect the seven teachings. Um... And then just as the participants were talking about some of the relearning that they were experiencing in the circle and with what they took from the circle, um, I've had to evaluate my sense of who's inferior and who's superior. I recognize silent perceptions that I've carried, and I'm not as low as I saw myself, and other people aren't as high as I saw them. So something pretty profound happens when we level the ground in a sharing circle like this. I expected us to be divided, but I realized we were more on the same page than not. This is a pretty profound one. I realized that I have more power as an Aboriginal woman than I ever knew I had.
and another one, I've learned that it's pretty, I've learned that it's actually not that hard to change. We can pretty easily inspire each other. That kind of goes against something that we, that, that there's like this governing idea out there that change, and it, there's truth to it, right? That change takes such a long time, it's such an involved process, people never change, things don't change, you know, but this says something different. We can change. Um, this is one of the non-Indigenous participants who talked about, as a result of the circle, I'm transitioning from guilt about my whiteness, about privilege, um, about being part of the dominant society, about the dominant culture, to awareness and action. Kind of similar to what the other person said about the breakthrough. And I don't feel so bad anymore. It's sort of a reflection on how um, getting caught in guilt can paralyze us. This is one of the art pieces. Um, it's actually the one that I made. And uh, it's called Aiming at Shalom. And this art piece was just sort of like um, a recognition. What this is trying to say, and I'm reluctant to say what it's trying to say because I want it to say whatever it's going to say to you. Um, but where it comes from is that spirit of, uh, you know what, when you put yourself out there, and say things about things that need to be different, you're going to be kind of target. You know, people are going to aim their arrows at you. <laughs> so, you know, be sparkly and fun about it, at least. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, if you're going to be a target, like, you can, it can be lacy. <laughs> That's not all that this is trying to say, but... Um, that was just sort of like me recognizing not only what I learned in the circle, but lots of the stories in my life. When you speak up, you're getting out in front of stuff that people don't want to hear about. So you've got to figure out how you're going to do that if you're going to keep doing it. Some of what we learned in the circle, so when we talked about summarizing at the end, what, was, what, what happened here, guys? What happened among us? Um, this is some of what we learned, that being disengaged is kind of like complicity with injustice. Complicity with what is. Um, engagement, so another way of saying that is engagement. That's like a location for change. Any kind of change. And it doesn't just have to be about social issues or big issues like decolonization. This can apply to lots of areas in our lives, right? Um, responsibility taking is important. We each have small steps that we can take. We each have things that we can... that, that wherever we're at in our lives, are little things that we can recognize our own ability to take responsibility for. Um, decolonizing is about unity, not division. So it's a unifying um, practice or effort, not one about othering and saying, you're over there, we're over here, we're in an argument, we're in a fight, we've got to fight each other. So that's, I don't think that's a decolonizing stance. Um, and we didn't, as a group, think that either. <laughs> um, this is really important. And I think I learned this from some Nate's literature. Um, it was kind of spelled out there. But um, there's no neutral in matters of equality. If you're not actively for something, you're cooperating with it. And so then you're essentially against it. So, so it's this kind of idea of disengagement being complicity. There is no such thing as neutral when it comes to justice. There's no neutral. It doesn't exist. Or at least these wise women in the sharing circle didn't think it did. <laughs> Um, and uh, this is some Richard Twist ideas here, I think. Um, so whenever reconciliation is a one-way street, whenever power imbalances have not or cannot be significantly addressed, when we can't have dialogue, when we can't talk about what is, um, whenever the system doesn't need to change or repent, then reconciliation is going to be false and incomplete. So genuine reconciliation includes mutuality and dialogue, and it's relational. So it's not an individualistic kind of pursuit. And uh, so false reconciliation then, if reconciliation is incomplete and kind of not the real deal, not the best it could possibly be, not the best that our creator has in store for us, has hopes for us, um, so false reconciliation leaves the system of dominating power intact and unrepentant. So genuine reconciliation always has something to do with power being addressed. Thank you.